we know that the primary purpose of government is to serve its sponsors, the people who profit from it, the lobbyists and the people behind them, the special interests, the lawyers, the politicians, and of course, the bankers and the war profiteers. So as we look at the corona policy coming out of Washington, D.C., it's very important to keep in mind that the goal of all of this one way or another is to ensure that the rich keep getting richer while the poor keep getting poorer. So for an economic analysis of what we're facing right now, let's start with the forced unemployment crisis going to zeroedge.com. The real unemployment rate is 21 percent and heading higher as businesses, agencies and organizations recalibrate to the reality that the v-shaped recovery was nothing but a brief fantasy six million additional jobs lost may be a best case scenario rather than the worst case scenario it is somewhat less than reassuring that the official unemployment rate of around 12 percent is roughly half of the real world unemployment rate as always in the wonderful world of statistics especially politically potent ones. It depends on what you measure, what you don't measure, slash act as if doesn't exist, and how you measure what you do measure. Everyone who digs beneath the headlines, num headline numbers of employment slash unemployment soon discovers a number of jarring anomalies in what the media presents as factual statistics. The first is that the Bureau of Labor Statistics, BLS, doesn't actually count the number of people who are employed slash unemployed. They rely on a sampling survey of employers, which is more like an election poll than an actual measurement. Now, the all right, the, the chart here, if you would get that back up there, uh, uh, unemployment insurance data for regular state programs. It's got this highlighted from the week ending July 11th versus July 4th. Things still going up. Back to the story, untangling the deception here. And remember, 86.54938752169854327.8% of all statistics are total made up bullshit designed to manipulate you. Secondly, they estimate the number of new businesses which are born and existing businesses that die and then guesstimate the number of additional employees this real time churn generates. This birth death model is notoriously inaccurate as it ignores little things like pandemics and is often magically revised to create or eliminate hundreds of thousands of presumed jobs. State unemployment offices tabulate the number of unemployment claims received and processed. These are real numbers, not guesses like the BLS estimates. Wolf Richter prepared a chart of the real unemployment claims numbers, which is reprinted below from his post. 32 million people on state and federal unemployment, second highest ever, week 17 of U.S. labor market collapse. The BLS reported that the U.S. employed workforce stood at about 152 million in February, with 32 million claiming unemployment. That's an employment rate of 21%. How do we arrive at a 12% unemployment rate? We ignore the 14.3 million contract slash gig workers who are currently drawing emergency federal unemployment via pandemic employment, unemployment assistance, PUA, which normally stands for pickup artist, and the 936,000 in the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation program. But even the 21% real world Unemployment rate doesn't reflect the full unemployment picture. Previously, full-time workers who have had their hours cut to part-time aren't counted in unemployment statistics, even though their employment status has changed for the worse. Then there are the millions of workers who were recalled to work as businesses reopened, whose employment is up in the air as the expected return to normal has failed to materialize. This chart is so powerful. Week 17. Total continued claims. This is what they are trying to hide. Oh, unemployment, it's just 12%. So back to the story here. What? How are they doing this? An entire class of workers has been glossed over. Small business owners who have 
closed their businesses. Those owners who incorporated and paid unemployment insurance on themselves as employees of the corporation qualified for unemployment, but many small business owners didn't pay themselves as employees and their status is uncertain. Now, as the story goes on here, in terms of the numbers, anecdotally, the number of small business owners who have decided to close in recent weeks appears to be significant as the hope for V-shaped recovery failed to materialize even as states reopened. <clears throat> this trend could gather momentum as hope to gaze into realistic assessment and funds borrowed from emergency federal programs runs out. Now, this reminds me, you know, I know this is kind of sound, sound like a bit of a sidebar here. Our friend Mimi Honor Mimi Robson, California State Libertarian Party Chair, as soon as California briefly opened up, and they opened up tattoo parlors, she went, she got a tattoo. And it was the last one that they're ever going to do with that tattoo shop. They opened up basically to have a going out of business sale. Now, it doesn't really make sense for a tattoo shop, right? We're going to use it the rest of the ink in stock. Like, you know, the ink's not the, the cost of the tattoo, right? That's the time of the tattoo artist. And when we went, and I know this is, we're getting into anecdotal here. But when we went to Prescott for court, to, to go to the Yavapai County Courthouse, we did, we did a little bit of shopping. You know, we went to Walmart and in and out and I went to Michael's. Uh, to, to buy a frame for uh, a uh, to, 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 to frame a, a flower, a pressed flower for my wife, you know. We saw half a dozen going out of business sales signs. How many businesses right now in America are going, oh, we can reopen? Good, we can liquidate inventory and just shut this thing down because we're out of here. This business is no longer viable. We don't want we don't want to keep this thing going. That's a significant number out there, too, that we don't know yet. That's definitely not that now. If the government want I mean, asking the government to keep track of these things is kind of like a murderer asking a murderer to keep track of your pain levels as he's stabbing you to death, right? Like <laughs> on a scale of uh, one, zero to 10, I'm, as, as the neat knife is, you know, in, entering my chest, I'm, I'm feeling about a four. Oh, oh, it's hitting my ribs now. Ooh, that's, ooh, that's a seven. Yeah. Oh, oh, I can feel it in my lungs. Yeah. I'm, oh yeah. That's a 10 on the zero to 10 pain scale. Can you write that down, please? <laughs> No, no, they're not going to do that. Is, the, is, is government going to really accurately keep track of how badly it's screwing? Now, somewhere, who's keeping The bankers are keeping track. They know. And it, yes, it's somewhere in some government statistic office. They, they've got this data. So let's skipping ahead in the story, the next bold line here. Could the number of unemployed rise to 38 million from 32 million, a 25% rate of unemployment as businesses, agencies, and organizations recalibrate to the reality that the V-shaped recovery was nothing but a brief fantasy? Six million additional jobs lost may be a best case scenario rather than a worst case scenario. And so here you have the, the scary cliff graphic right there, all employees, total non-farm. You hear, they have to put this in non-farm payroll. The whole employment statistic thing itself, I just have to point this out, as I always do when, when this comes up. It really is a backwards way of looking at things. Now, now, not, maybe not backwards. Maybe backwards isn't the right term. It's a pro-authoritarian powers that be way of looking at things. To think that 100% employment should be the goal. No, nonsense. It should be 100% retirement, as in work should be optional for everybody at this point. Then we have the wealth and the financial independence that, that everybody can realize their potential as, as an entrepreneur, as an artist, as someone contributing something more meaningful to society than being a cog in the machine, working for a wage slave job, where today the average working American now paying 50% of what they earn to the government when you add it all up. It's disgusting. No. So what are the consequences of this? Let's let's look for a second here 
to the next story from Bloomberg via Yahoo.com, a glimpse into the fiscal doom bearing down on America's city. So what is the impact for government here, not just at the federal and the state level, but in the ways that the rubber meets the road for a lot of Americans in their relationships with government through the city governments that they live under? In Cincinnati, a city of 300,000 on the banks of the Ohio River, Mayor John Cranley faces cuts to police, fire, and sanitation without more help from Washington. The city has already had it now. Just oh gosh. Now this this sentence, you know, on its face is sort of factually true. But just the, the, the there, there's a dangerous lie in the premise behind this that a city of 300,000 people can't provide these things for itself. I mean, yeah, we're all forced into the federal system, forced to use the U.S. dollar as opposed to money that's not designed to rip us off. Okay, so yeah, it, it, that's, on its face, current circumstances, yeah, it may be true. But that there's this dependence on authority. Like, if it wasn't for the big daddy central government authority, cities and local governments and you and your community, you couldn't handle that. This is a very, very dangerous premise of statism that needs to be deconstructed, even just in, in covering this, this, this you know, economic analysis. The city has already had to tiptoe back from the fiscal abyss earlier this year by temporarily laying off a quarter of its workforce and balancing its budget with debt. So, oh yeah, shocking, right? This is, this is supposed to be news. A government agency has oh, gov a, a city government has to use debt to come to no that's seventy percent of Cincinnati's revenue comes from taxes on wages, and with the coronavirus continuing to spread, leaving record of joblessness in its wake, Cranley says he fears permanent declines in essential services. I do have to point out a little bit of mainstream media propaganda here, even too. The coronavirus is not leaving record joblessness in its wake. I mean, that's just the sensationalism of that sentence. Yeah. Sensationalism used to perpetuate a lie. And the lie is that the virus is responsible for the unemployment crisis as opposed to the government shutdowns. The pandemic reduced tax collections across the country as safety precautions to limit the spread of the virus, shuttered businesses and kept shoppers and tourists at home. A resurgence of the virus has forced states to reverse or slow reopenings. And again, okay, gotta point out the lie here. No, no, no. A resurgence in statistics has given governments fresh excuses to violate your rights, to slow, to reverse or slow reopening. This is uh, just, all right, but it, to the point of the story here, discussion over what to do about America's depleted cities reaches a climax of sorts this week. As congressional leaders say, they'll hammer out an aid package in May, a three and a half trillion dollar round of stimulus that includes roughly $1 trillion for state and local governments passed the U.S. House only to stall in the Republican-controlled Senate. Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has said the Senate will attempt to craft a bill of its own, while the White House has put a $1 trillion ceiling on additional federal aid. Now, why is it, you know, why is it happening like this, right? Well, why are they, well, you think, well, Adam, they, they want, if, you're, if governments are so evil and, why, and the governments are behind this, don't they want governments to be strong? Well, they don't want local governments to be strong. They don't want city governments to be strong. They want federal governments to be, the federal government to be strong. More easy to manipulate is a consolidation of wealth and power. So as long as they can get the majority of the American people to buy into or passively go along with the narrative that local governments can't function without the federal government overbearing providing guidance and economic relief and blah, blah, blah. They, they can't, they're, they're okay with this upheaval because what's the result going to be? 
more consolidation of power in the federal government. Now, where does this come down to actually affecting most Americans? You know, like what is, you know, we've talked about the situation that a lot of people find themselves in right now. The, the millions on unemployment going, you know, hey, is this, you know, government assistance going to allow me to continue to eat, let alone pay my rent while there's an eviction moratorium on here and I haven't paid my rent in months? This is a big deal. This is not just some abstract analysis. There are millions of Americans today, and it's hard to say how many, certainly more than a few, maybe less than, is, is it, you know, there's some, somewhere less than 50 million, you know, one in six Americans, maybe. You know, we see the unemployment at, at, at possibly 32 million or 32 million people on, on unemployment assistance. There's a lot of others who are affected by that. I mean, you say it's only one in six Americans, you know, really directly experiencing this economically. How many of them have dependents, children, spouses, uh, you know, other people who depend on them? How many people are maybe not in the desperate situation that we've been describing of? can't pay rent, running out of savings, about to, about to face on a, you know eviction because yeah, they, there are for, for every person who's in that right now, you know what to me is that you know the, the prototypical worst case scenario. And remember all the stuff we talked about with unemployment, not counting people who aren't you know working on the how many how many people are working under the table? how many babysitters? just how many people? And I know this is like a bad example. It's just one small example, right? But hey, well, guess what? Parents forced to stay at home. Children forced to stay at home. Maybe there are not a lot of people hiring babysitters. But you're not allowed to have some, you know, if you, someone, you or you, someone in your home tested positive in Hidalgo County, Texas, you're not allowed to have visitors. Of course, you can't have a babysitter come and babysit your kids. How many people have bartenders? servers working under the table, people working in just informal employment arrangements. But even not counting them, just the prototypical person who's, you know, paying rent, living paycheck to paycheck, boom, paycheck disappears. Moratorium on rent kicks in, and now you're four months behind on rent, you have no savings left, your prospects for a job are pretty grim. So we go now to CNET.com. COVID rent relief is ending. Will July 25 bring a tsunami of eviction? It's a big question we got to ask here. Now, there's a bit of a fear-mongering fear angle around this that, that some pundits have engaged with, and I don't want to play into that because I've done this a little bit in prior shows. Oh, my God, yes, there's a tsunami of evictions coming. It doesn't look quite like it's going to be that bad. At least it looks like it's not going to be that sudden i should say right and if it was sudden it would be worse than if it was you know they're, they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna bring the pain on slowly and in waves here remember the federal moratorium on eviction is somewhat limited in its application as, as, as jim did a little research on this morning and then it's not just hey we made it there's a federal law you can't evict anybody that that would be a bit of a stretch right because we pointed out that they couldn't do that even if they tried in a case where like I'm if I'm renting to someone here in Gardenia saying, yeah, you give me four hundred dollars a month and you can camp here. Then and I decide to kick them out. They're not going to be able to stop me. Right. If it's I'm renting a spare bedroom or it's Airbnb. No, they're not going to be able to stop you from, you know, the, the casual evictions. They stop for. What was it? Businesses that were receiving federal aid, federal housing assistance, Section 8, or were federally sponsored some other way as part of a federal HUD program. So that is, is, is that everybody who's renting? No, that's just a minority of renters in, in the United States. But it's a lot of people. That's a lot of minorities. By the way, the whole, this is affecting, you know, black people disproportionately. It's like, well, it's affecting poor people. Affecting people who aren't, you know, like, hey, you got a government job, you're you're paying for government insurance, you're on the, you know, unemployment team. All right, we'll take care of you. Oh, you wanted to be free? Oh, you didn't want to? Oh, you wanted a job where you didn't have to pay for the warfare state? You didn't want to subsidize the military industrial complex with your labor? Sorry, you're not on our list for relief. So what happens if Congress doesn't pass another stimulus bill to extend or place current protections? Here's what we know. 
Will there be an eviction moratorium after the Federal CARES Act runs out on July 25? If you're one of nearly 12 million U.S. adults living in a household that didn't make rent this month, month, you might have to brace yourself for the tsunami of evictions that's approaching a state and national rent protections are set to expire in the coming days. Federal eviction protection ends July 25 and the federally enhanced unemployment benefit that adds $600 a week expires days later. So it says 12 million U.S. households living in a household that didn't make rent this month. Plus kids, 24 million. Plus those that can't make rent, plus those that didn't make rent in months prior. The seems actually a little low. Because 12 million U.S. adults living, you know, how many of those live alone? How many of those live together? This seems like an under-inclusive statistic to me. But it is worth putting it in proportion to see how many are affected by each expiring eviction moratorium. Because it's not just the federal one, it's the state. And then it's the actual eviction enforcement policy because evictions have to go through a legal process that it's not just ah uh, you're evicted get out right you know you file a legal notice and it depends on what what just jurisdiction you are uh you're in the u.s senate is now actively discussing a second stimulus check as part of a larger rescue bill but right now there's no legislation set to replace or extend these and other relief measures meanwhile statewide eviction bans have mostly either already ended or will do so soon with Many with no replacement in sight. Michigan, for example, let its eviction moratorium lapse, as have several other states. A handful of states never canceled evictions to begin with. Where does this leave? Where does this all leave you? In August, rent still due on the first, or can or excuse me, <laughs> is August rent still due on the first, or can you still get an extension? Can your landlord even evict you if your payment is late? What laws, if any, can you help can help you keep your home as you whether the coronavirus recession, will there be any uh, another stimulus check and rescue package that might help? You know, there's a lot to consider here. And the last thing in this story says, ask your landlord for a reduction or extension. In almost all instances, it's probably best to work out an arrangement with your landlord or leasing agency, if at all possible. Although some landlords have reacted to the pandemic by reportedly putting even more pressure on tenants to pay up. Others have risen to the occasion. Some going so far as to stop collecting rent payments for the next few months. Now, a lot of those are not going reported in that 12 million number. So yeah, this is going to get uglier here. What is my conclusion on this? It's going to continue to get rougher over the next few months. This is not going to be a cliff like the forced unemployment cliff. They are going to uh, let this one happen slowly. So what is the what's the effect of all this? The Fed is going to buy stocks. Yeah, really beautiful, stark headline from Forbes.com. Kevin Coldiron, the Fed is going to buy stocks. I don't know precisely when. Sorry, day traders. But it will happen and probably soon. The first half of the Fed's dual mandate is to promote maximum employment. That means avoiding and mitigating recessions, supporting the S&P. 500 is central to this effort, not because a fall in the market signals a recession is coming, but because it is the recession. This isn't what we're taught in Economics 101, and frankly, it isn't how most economics economists understand the market. So the idea requires a little backstory. No, it doesn't. The backstory is the creature from Jekyll Island, known as the Federal Reserve. That's the book by uh, G. Edward Griffin. If you really want to understand what the Federal Reserve is set up to do, surprise, surprise. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer. Maintain full unemployment? Yeah, okay. The stock market falling is the recession? No, I don't buy it. Because stock market prices, as we learned from, of all people, J.P. Morgan Chase CEO Jamie Dimon just a couple months ago, not even, that it is the Federal Reserve liquidity that is propping up stock market prices right now. Which leads us to the next piece of propaganda from Forbes.com. Will the economy crash if the $600 federal unemployment isn't extended? Now, in order to ask this question, you have to ignore all the other questions, which would be, why did America get so dependent on the federal government relief in the first place? 
Why do we not reclaim financial independence and say, we're not going to put up with this system set up to exploit and rip us off anymore? Why do we believe this propaganda? Why do we accept a system set up this way? Why are we facing an evictions crisis that is going to put millions and millions of Americans out of their homes in the coming months? Well, more importantly, why don't we do something about it? And I know after just covering all of this uh, economic propaganda, I, to, to, to go put a, a decisive conclusion on this is, is, is almost, you know, feeling artificially tacked on. But in, in, in all the things that we as libertarians have been advocating for years, buy Bitcoin, buy gold and silver, get away from the dollar, don't let the government control your economy or you're going to suffer. And as much as you can, arrange your own personal economic life to make yourselves impervious from this kind of manipulation. Well, if you had listened, you'd be a lot more comfortable right now. As a lot of